Hey everyone. Okay, so we are officially live. I'm so freaking excited for this panel, the Afro Latinidad panel. I am here with some amazing, incredible authors whose <laughs> presence that I'm like literally <laughs> just graced by. So thank you so much, all of y'all, for being here, for showing up, for everything that y'all do in the book community. Um, I figured we would get started by um, doing some introductions. I would absolutely love it if uh, Jasmine would start with, just tell us a little bit about our, yourself, whatever you whatever you wanna share with us. Well, hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jasmine Mendez. I live in Houston, Texas. Um, I'm a writer, poet, performance poet, actress, playwright mother of a toddler who is uh, taking a nap, or so I hope. <laughs> Otherwise, she may barge in here. But, uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I've got two, book, two books published um, and uh, three forthcoming. Uh, my husband always likes to tease me about that. Um, yes, I do, I write, I write a lot of things. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to be here. Uh, my family is originally from La República Dominicana, Dominican Republic, for those who don't speak Spanish. Um, they live there now. They return to the island after many years. Uh, and I'm sad I can't be there with them right now because, <laughs> uh, you know, America. Uh, and yeah, that's that's me. <laughs> mm. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Liz, would you like to go next? Sure. Hopefully everyone can hear me clearly. Um, yeah. yeah, you're good. I am Liz Flo. Okay, cool. I am Liz Flo. I live in Miami, Florida. I am poet, spoken word artist, um, working on a YA, so podcaster, crystal seller, bruja, all kind of stuff. So um, my family, I'm Puerto Rican and Haitian, and um, that's what I got. Beautiful. Thank you. Adriana, would you go next? Yes. Um, I am Adriana Herrera. I am a author. I write adult romance um, centering Afro-Latinx characters. I am Afro-Dominicana, born and raised in the DR. I live in New York City, but I um, came to the States as an adult. So I came like in my 20s, my whole family still in the DR. Um, and yeah, I write books centering queer people, um, Afro-Dominican people. Um, my tagline is I write romance that sounds full of people that look and sound like my people getting unapologetic mm. happy endings and that like, mm basically it's like what I do. <laughs> yeah. Critical. Okay, thank you. And last but most certainly not least, Aya, would you like to tell us about yourself? Absolutely. My name is Aya De Leon. Um, I am a West Coast Afro Latina hailing from Berkeley, California. Um, my background is Puerto Rican, African American, and West Indian via St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, I'm coming out of kind of a period of hip hop, spoken word, hip hop theater, spoken word. I still teach poetry, um, but for the last decade or so since becoming a mom, um, I've been a novelist. Um, I have four books out in my Justice Hustler series which are feminist heist romances um, with a sort of a, sort of like a, a Puerto Rican woman in the center, but also African-American, West Indian and Afro-Dominicana characters, queer women. And um, it centers on a group, of, <clears throat> a group of sex workers who are organizing their and providing healthcare services to their community and have to turn to a life of crime to keep the doors of their clinic open. Um, and then this fall, I have uh, my first standalone spy novel coming out, A Spy in the Struggle, about um, FBI infiltration of an eco-racial justice organization uh, in the community. Um, and, uh, and I also have like a Black Latina teen spy girl YA series I'm trying to sell. So hopefully we'll have some news about that by 2021. Mm -hmm. That's what I got going on. So, in other words, you don't sleep. That's what I heard. <laughs> we don't I need to sleep. 
Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I just, I don't even know how y'all, I, I have to start by saying, I don't know how y'all do what you do. Um, having, you know, your career as a writer and then having a life, you know, children, spouses, partners, et cetera, and then just navigating as, you know, Afro Latinx in this world and what that means and, and all of the, the weight and the beauty um, and the pain that comes with that. I just, so it, it just amazes me that y'all are so able to consistently create and offer your works to the world. Um, and I wanted to ask you all some questions. So the kind of the structure of the lime of the lime the lime stream. You can, can you tell I'm hungry? The structure of the live stream is I'm going to ask each of y'all questions in turn, and then I am going to ask y'all questions that I would like each of you to answer one by one. And I think that we'll end by opening up if we have time, of course. Uh, we'll end by opening up questions to our audience um, and seeing if. Anybody else has further questions for y'all before we complete our live show? Um, okay, cool. So I'm just gonna hop into the questions because I, I want answers. Like <laughs> there's so many things I wanna ask y'all. Okay, so my first question is for Adriana and it is, last year you released Mangoes and Mistletoe, a salacious and food driven Christmas romantic novella. As an Afro-Latina, why was it important for you to write a romance centering food? Um, well, I like a lot of my books center food. My debut, um, American Dreamer, is about an Afro-Dominican queer man who has a Afro-Latinx burrito mm -hmm. food truck, and he takes it to upstate New York to like kind of make it a success. So, and I. The part of what I like to do with food is um, I think it's always like a really effective point of entry mm -hmm. for immigrants in American life. Like, our, like you know, we may not be welcome at certain points, but mm -hmm. our food is always good. So it's a good um, it's a good place to kind of center us. And um, also, like as an immigrant, I came here as an adult and food is such like a touchstone for us culturally, um, you know, like make those habichuelas like your mom made them at home like that taste of you can you can go back home um with a plate of food mm -hmm. and so I, I like to center that but specifically with this no, um novella it's two afro dominicana so it's suli who is a first generation dominican from new york and kiskeya who is a dominican who had just come from the dr recently and they end up it's like it's basically great British Bake Off fanfic, but like make it lesbian, make it um, Afro-Dominican. So it's these two Dominican women who are in this competition and they're put together because they're Dominican. So everybody expects them to just get along. But for Suli, um, food is, because she is from an immigrant family, being extra Dominican is how she centers herself in a culture, in a dominant culture that is whiteness. Mm. And for Kiskeya, she's trying to prove to people that just because she just came from the DR doesn't mean she doesn't know the classic techniques, that she's a real pastry chef. So mm. she's trying to like downplay the Dominican side. So they're mm. butting heads from mm. the get go. And so what I was trying to present there is our relationship to our culture and how food is such a big part of how we express ourselves mm -hmm. and how we go home, but can also like distance ourselves from it and adapt mm -hmm. to the new places. So I'm, I was trying to do a whole lot, but it's also mm -hmm. like super hot and they have mm -hmm. a ton of hot sex. And it's, um, yeah, it's kind of like my little way of like also playing with flavors. Like they're doing all these pastries and all these things and I'm trying to infuse like, you know, like making mango custard and mm -hmm. all these different things. So it's kind of like, I love playing with food because it's just a way of like being creative and showing our flavors um, in ways that I think are accessible to mm -hmm. a lot of people. Sure. So that's my long answer. I love the long answers, please. <laughs> it's just like weeping internally the whole time. Um, that, that, that duality between those two characters, I think is, especially important talking about um, 
the ways that first generation individuals, Afro-Latinx individuals approach food. And I think a lot of that is because like a lot of the politics when you are, um, when you are first generation versus when, um, how do I put this? When your Afro-Latinidad is never in question because you, you were born elsewhere and then immigrated here, it can be so difficult for those individuals to be seen beyond la comida, right? Mm -hmm. um, for example, my mother is a chef, uh, a Mexican woman who is a chef, and her struggle was getting people to see past her Mexicanness to acknowledge her ability to perform classically trained techniques in the kitchen, you know, as you were saying. But on the flip side, for me, I've always felt as somebody who was born in the United States, as somebody who isn't clocked as Latinx, um, I've always felt that food is like, I'm expected to prove, right? That I can make the dishes that I know the culture um, versus it being like, you know, I just I just think that having those two characters and what they both bring to Afro-Latinidad um, is so important and critical. I just, I just love it. We're, we're not a monolith. Like exactly. even within our same culture, there's so much, there's such mm -hmm. a spectrum of experiences. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. And even like, like you said, like our approach, even to the same cuisine is different because our relationships to the food and to our culture is all, it's not monolithic, like you said. Um, okay. So another question for you, you in your personal life, you work with survivors of physical and sexual violence. How does your social work inform your storytelling? Um, a lot. Um, so my day job is I'm a trauma therapist. I work in New York City um, and I'm a trauma therapist working specifically with survivors of interpersonal violence. So I work with adults and children who have experienced domestic violence, um, sexual violence as children or as or um, as adults. And most of the, I'm a Spanish speaker, so a lot, all of my clients are Spanish speakers because it's really hard to find a Spanish speaking therapist, even mm -hmm. in New York City. So mm -hmm. all of my clients are Spanish speakers, which means that most of my clients are Afro Latinx. They're Dominican, they're Puerto Rican, they're sometimes from South America for them, but I work in Harlem for the most part. So most of my clients are Afro Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And so, um, a lot of what is is the thrust, right, of the intersections of, of the experiences that they have, um, the trauma of the violence they survived, but also the violence of um, um, that comes from the government, the violence that comes mm -hmm. from their blackness, the, the violence that comes from their immigration, from being in a diaspora, the blackness that comes from poverty, mm -hmm. from not speaking the language. So I'm constantly like in a world where I'm seeing so many struggles and so much resilience, right? Like they're just like striving to find their healing, to be happy, to be whole. They're moms, they're, you know, teens. And so I really try to like my work, my work as a romance author and my work as a person that's been working as a in the domestic violence field for almost 10 years like I have to maintain hope if I don't maintain hope if I don't believe firmly that my clients can heal from their traumatic experiences then I can't walk with them and bear witness to their healing in the way that is in a way that is helpful and it's the same for the stories I write I have to believe like that us in our in the way that we are with the, all the intersections of things that are kind of cutting across our lives that we can't have full bright future. So that mm -hmm. influences a lot. Like I'm, I think I do a lot of repairing um, with my writing of the things that I see in my clients' lives. So I, I try to, I write a lot about social workers. Um, my latest book here to stay, um, the heroine is a Dominican Puerto Rican woman who works for a nonprofit that serves refugee children and immigrant families. And so I try to um, insert a lot of what I see, what I, I do a lot of like fancy writing about like my ideal programs. Like if you had, if I had no limits of budget, what I would do with the programs that um, that appear in my book. So it influenced it a ton, but I, I think mostly like I, it's centered kind of the same thing, like hope and trying to really put forth that we're not just one thing. My clients are not just their trauma. Mm -hmm. My clients are not just the pain that they've experienced. You know, they come and they're, and they're funny and they're, 
you know, quirky and they're like really pissed off because like they try to bake a cake the night before and it didn't come out mm -hmm. like they wanted it. So it's, it's their whole people. And I think one of the things that has happened with us, with us in fiction, right, is that we're never whole people. We're always like this like one dimensional thing. And what we get to do yeah. as people who are writing from lived experience is that we get to put a whole person on the page. Mm. And, we're, and we don't get, um, you know, our, our characters don't get to be defined by their trauma and their pain. They, they get to be entire people. And so I, I, that's, that's like one of the ways, but like consent is something I think a lot about. Power dynamics is something that I think a lot about um, with my writing, how I set up couples, just because I am constantly um, listening and working with people who have had relationships where they were powerless and they were helpless and situation like, you know, behaviors in heroes that I, in romance I find problematic. Um, you know, aggressive men, alpha, alpha heroes and behaviors that really don't turn into love. Like a person that is selfish and shitty to you as in the courtship process is just going to get worse Yes. Um, once they have you um, in their control. So I really try to kind of like, um, push back on some of those behaviors and, and, and what, they really are. They're not actually cute. <laughs> <Not cute. laughs> so, um, so yes, that's how all, I mean, my work influences my life in many ways, but in my writing, it's definitely very present. Okay. I imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I imagine that there's something so inherently political and so inherently healing for you about being an Afro-Latinx individual healing other people within your diaspora. Um, that's, I, I can't, I, I can't think of a more superhero job than that, to be honest. Yeah. And it's, I mean, and that's what I've been, I wanted to do. I went mm -hmm. back to school to be a, ther a trauma therapist because in my work as an advocate, I was constantly having issues finding therapists who were black people, who were mm -hmm. Afro-Latinx people who understood what mm -hmm. the clients needed, who had the mm -hmm. cultural competence mm -hmm. and the understanding and the context to do really good healing work for, for our communities. Right. So it's, yeah, it's definitely, it's, it's, uh, it's very much where I want to be. And it's important to, for me to be in, in Afro Latinx communities doing this work. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, what was my next question? I can't read. Okay. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. So the last question that I have for you is you write romance, which centers the joy and pleasure of the Afro Latinidad. Can you share why this is critical in 2020, especially? Oh, I, so much like, um, there's this book, um, by this woman, Adrienne Marie Brown, it's, um, called pleasure activism. And that book, I read it last year and it really kind of like blew my mind. And I actually used it to, um, write the heroine in the last book of the dreamer series, which is, um, American sweethearts. And the heroine is a police officer who is really burnt out. She works in special crimes and her passion is being an activist around sex education in Afro-Latinx communities. So the, the work that she sees as work of social justice for her is going into her communities and really kind of um, helping or um, walking with people as they find ways to have agency over their pleasure, over their bodies to dismantle Mm -hmm. all the ways in which our bodies have been commodified mm -hmm. and to really decolonize our black and brown bodies so that we can experience um, love and pleasure. And so to me, like what we do, writing books for women, black and brown women, black and brown people of all genders get to be loved and pleasured and like have full, like, like plenitude in their in their enjoyment of their bodies and of people like 
loving them, caring for their bodies and their pleasure to me is the work of social justice. I really do think there is, because it, it cannot always just be about our struggle, right? Like getting over isn't just getting over in terms of like what we can have, like the material things we can have, but like get like being able to like be in our bodies. There's so much pain that the trauma is in the body, right? Like the body mm -hmm. holds our trauma and to be able to heal and be able to like fully experience the pleasure that we, that our bodies can give us and that mm -hmm. people who come to our lives can give us is, it's beautiful. I mean, I think that shit is like radical, radical work mm -hmm. that we do with, with those books and really trying, like being kind to ourselves. Um, I think a lot about um, the uses of the erotic. It's a essay by Audre Lorde. And I use it a lot um, when I think about my work and how I write um, the women and men or people of any gender that I write, um, trans characters that I write, like really like being able to to be present in our bodies. And it's something like our bodies, you know, there's so much that is done to us. Um, mm -hmm. And and having whole people who have like seriously good sex with people that like, with partners that want to please them, that's mm -hmm. beautiful. And we never get to see that in media. We never get to see that. Ever. <laughs> like, <laughs> just like, let's underline that, you know? Sure. But, and there's something, it's, it's so important to have even when when we do get to see that having that come from us and not through a white lens is is yeah. key you know because then that's others defining what those what that looks like for us which which cannot be allowed yeah it's radical work i think what we do like being fearless in that way of presenting like people just having like really good sex and mm -hmm. people like a partner who's like striving to like please us is mm -hmm. something that's beautiful and like that we need to see. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Okay, my next question, I'm like fighting a sneeze right now. So if I'm making weird faces, it's because of who I am as a person. My next question is for Liz and um, it's kind of a long one, so just, <laughs> just bear with me. So you describe your poetry as literary constellations and you created the word astrolistics, which you define as a manifestation, alignment, and understanding of surrender. How did your Afro-Latinidad inform this concept? And can you share more about it with us? Sure. Um, so I guess the first part is um, poetry as constellations is kind of being able to make my poetry eternal, like make the words and the energy of the poetry eternal and can be referred to after, you know, years to come. And um, also like hope, because we look at the stars and we wish upon a star, we, we are able to create these realities for ourselves. And um, in regard to Astro six, I think it's just, everything together about who I am. So like my abuela was a piritista, my dad was into, you know, he taught me voodoo. Um, mm -hmm. We saw Walter Mercado and he was all about the astro. So I think it's just, it's that combination of speaking life into myself mm -hmm. and the people around me, I think really is what Astro mm -hmm. Six is all about. And so, you know, Afro Latinidad for me is literally every single culture just combining and becoming this super manifestation of who I am and what I want to share with others. Okay, so first of all, that like that gives me so much to think about. And oh, the, the yeah. first thing that I'm thinking is what what really struck with me is when you talked about the concept of eternity through poetry. And the reason that that hit me uh, heavily in particular is because mm. I'm thinking about all of the genocide that our people have endured, um, continue to endure, um, the genocide not only of our bodies, but of our our mm. art, you know, our, our creativity. And so I'm wondering, as you, the, 
how do I put this into words? Because it's all it's all in a jumble up here. The question that I'm trying to ask is, do you see your poetry as a way of directly pushing back against the erasure of us, um, the erasure of our bodies, our spirits, our creativity, et cetera? Or is that, or was it a little different? Definitely. Um... No, I definitely do. I think especially with everything that has gone on this year, the very loud dehumanization of us, um, I'm thinking what kind of important work that I can do in regards to my poetry. Most of it was, you know, erotic relationships and things like that. But this year, I've really, I've done some workshops. And I think Sonia Renee Taylor was the one who said, you know, words are spells and we create the worlds that we want to live in. And so what will we create in poetry and in books that we want to see? And my thought is I want to see women being goddesses and honored and, and being the altar and receiving offerings. Um, black people being human and not being persecuted for joy. So these are the themes that I'm putting into my work. So, you know, times we have to get creative to create the world that we can't see now, but we can create for somebody else to keep the baton going. I hear that. Okay, so the next question that I have is for, um, wait, what happened? Did I just lose my spot? Okay, the next question that I have is for Jasmine. Um, so we are all really excited. <laughs> about your debut children's book, um, Jose de las Habichuelas, which releases in 2021 from Arte Publico. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to write a children's book? And what can you tell us about it? Um, the main reason was because I had a child. <laughs> um, and I started, I started reading a lot of picture books and children's books, and it was like all I consumed for about a year. It was also the last year of my grad school program. So aside from like, I needed a break, right? From like the heavy, like MFA reading and writing and all of that. Um, and, but I, I've also been a teacher. I've, I've taught K through 12 for over 10 years. Um, and I just kind of like re-fell in love with the picture books. And I realized how much they could do as I would like take those money. I stopped going to the library y'all for like a really long time um, just cause life. And I was just like teaching full time. And I just, I just like forgot that libraries were a thing. And then I had my daughter and they do these little like infant and toddler programs at the library for free several days a week. And I started taking her and I was like, oh, I love, I like, I love the library. I used to spend hours. It was like the only place my parents would allow me to go as a kid ever um, was the library. And so uh, I re fell in love with the library. I fell in love again with like picture books and I started reading them. Um, but of course, you know, uh, as the writer that I am, I was like, oh, mm -hmm. where are all the Afro Latinx characters? I don't understand. I mean, I understand because <laughs> clearly uh, they're not anywhere uh, <laughs> from, from children's books to adult books, right? There's, there's scares. And so, um, so I wanted that for my daughter, even though she is not black presenting, um, she, she definitely is like very Mexicana looking, um, but I wanted her to expose her, you know, I want her to have the books that I didn't have. I'm always, I live by Toni Morrison's quote, if there's mm. a book you want to read that hasn't been written, then you must write it. And so I write for my former, you know, eight-year-old self, my former five-year-old self. I write for my middle school self. I write for my high school self. I write for my 20-year-old self. Um, and as I get older, I will continue to write those books that for me, I'm like, if I can't find it, if it's not out there, then like clearly there's a gap and I need to, I should be writing it. I need to find something within me to, to tell those stories. Um, and so, and even with Arte Publico, whom I love dearly, um, and they are like the oldest, um, the longest running Latino publishing uh, house uh, in, in, in the States and over 30 years, uh, they they have a deficit and they know that, right? They know they're like, you know, when I told Marina, I was like, hey, I've got a couple of like children's books ideas, you know, she's like, we want all of them, just send them, <laughs> send them our way, we want them, we want your, we want your books, you know? And even the ones that have, um, that I've seen out, they're not just the Publico, but the, the few that I've seen that are like Caribbean or Dominican or Puerto Rican, they still don't have mm -hmm. Afro Puerto Rican characters, Afro Dominican characters. Yeah. And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, hello, like, <laughs> you know? And so, um, and then Josefina Zabichuela specifically is about Abichuelas con dulce, which is uh, a traditional Dominican dish that we have only at Easter. Um, well, I mean, you can have it anytime, but really like that's that's when we, we eat it. Um, Y'all, trying to ask my people why or where this dish comes from was just like, <laughs> 
Porque así son las cosas. Siempre se hace. Siempre se, I'm like, I can't put that in. A, like, that's not a, re, a rationale. That's not a good children's book. Like, you can't just be like, because that's the way it is. But then in the end, I was kind of like, well, you know what? Like, that's our people. And like, what's wrong with that? And so, you know, in the book, it's this little girl who gives up eating sweets for Lent. Um, and like me, she loves sweets. And so it's like really hard for her. But she learns, you know, how to like stay strong and like not give in to like all the sweet stuff, um, the sugary stuff. Her mom still makes her like smoothies, but not like, you know, cupcakes and flan and like all this stuff. So that then like her reward is like her mom teaching her how to make the family recipe of habichuelas con dulce. And she's in the kitchen with her mom and her tias and her abuela. And, they're making the, the habichuelas con dulce. And it's like this big thing. I mean, it's a very family thing. Like you don't, you don't make like a little bit of habichuelas con dulce. Like it's like a thing, like it's huge, you know, for, for everyone to share and like be in community with, you know? And so she learns like, you know, just, it's all about family and like her growing up and uh, resilience and all that. And so, and it, cause again, like I'm, I live in Texas. And so we've got all these wonderful books of like too many tamales and what can you do with a paleta and all these very like Mexican things that of course I want my daughter to also like read and to know about that side of her culture. But mm -hmm. I was like, where are the Dominican food books for mm -hmm. kids? You know, <laughs> like we need that too. Sure. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's where that came from. Mm. I've never had avichelas and I'm, I'm dying now. <laughs> People are like, oh, it's like beans that are sweet. I'm like, don't, don't hate it. Don't knock it till you try it. You can't even, don't go there. <laughs> like, yeah, you gotta no. try it. Two, yeah. Like two great things put together. You know what I mean? So there's no way, there's no way it couldn't be good. It's just, I really want some now. <laughs> I want some now. Yeah. And it was like, like, I don't oh, know, no, so pandemic, but I was like so excited. I was like, oh yeah, when like my book release comes out, hopefully it'll be in the spring and I can have little like tacitas of habichuelas con dulce to give to the kids. And I'm like, it's into pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, 2020 mm -hmm. is just, let me not start. Let's not. Let's I know. not. <laughs> we don't have enough time. <laughs> I, know. I know. So, okay. Um, so, because you, I, I guess it's not correct anymore to say that you're not a children's author, but because that wasn't your um, your start, I suppose, did you find that writing a children's book was more challenging than you anticipated? Um, what was the process like for you? Was it scary? For sure. Yeah, no, for sure. It was, um, I'm long-winded. I got, I got a lot to say. Uh, and children's books, <laughs> the good ones, are not long-winded, right? They, they say a lot, but it's the economy of words, right? So I, I did... I did rely, I tried to rely more heavily on my poetry background of like, okay, what what is extra? What does not need to be here? What can I pull away? Um, it's it's still a fairly, like it's on the longer side for children's books, Josefina Sabichuelas is. Um, and my editor was like, take that out. And I was like, no, but I want that, you know? And I was like, okay, no, like, is it adding to the story? Like, what are we doing here? Um, so it was challenging. I, I sent Marina probably about four children's books where she was like very kind, um, but she was kind of like, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's really, you know, okay, do you, do you have anything else? Well, maybe, like she was really sweet about it. And then finally I was like, look, I've got this idea, you know, I've, I really looked at your, you know, what kind of books you, you, you publish with regard to like culture and all that. And so I had this idea, you know, this food thing. And, and so I wrote it and, and we did, we went back and forth a lot with edits just to skim it down. And so it is more challenging than people, than I think people realize. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not just like cute little rhymes or, you know, like, you know, you write 15 sentences and there you go. Like you really have to like build and like, you know, there should, for a lot of them, like if you do want a narrative or do you want a, like a moral lesson, um, but without like, you know, sort of hammering it in or being really like cliche or cheesy, like how can you make some of these ideas uh, original um, and engaging to students um, and the language too, like you want to be sure that the language is accessible, but still challenging and interesting um, that there's rhythm. And, and again, that's why I think I rely a lot on my, my poetry background to make sure that it's like musically, um, exciting to stu to to kids um, as they're listening to it, um, and that also the parents can kind of like connect with it because I think parents influence, right? Parents can really influence what kind of books their their kids are exposed to, um, mm -hmm. and a lot of times, you know, as they get older, kids are you know pick their own choose their own books, but you know, as a mom, like I'm usually the one like, oh, here we go, like I'll grab this for loose, and and so um, you have to you want to be able to also kind of like think about. Is 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 this like a, a book that, especially as like as as Latinos, right? Like, is this something that like the family could sit around and like read and get excited about? And or like, it could it jump off into other stories of like, oh, mommy, you tell me, you know, your habichuelas con dulce recipe, or do you have a story about that? You know, mm -hmm. and thinking about like how can we bring the family together through books? Um, but yeah, it was definitely. I'm working on another children's book right now, and like, it's a hot mess. Um, I have this, you know, this beautiful idea in my head, and it's you know, 
it's about like Haitian Dominican unity and all this wonderfulness. And it's like, I get down to writing it and I'm like, why are there so many words on the page? Uh, <laughs> you know? So, so yeah, I, I think that being a poet does help with that, but, but it is challenging. I, that actually segues almost too perfectly into the other question that I have for you. So we're just going to dance right into that. Um, <laughs> The question is, you're also releasing a YA memoir in the mm -hmm. same year. Can you tell us about its focus, themes, and can we expect to see your wonderful poetry in it? So actually, no, there's no poetry in this book, surprisingly. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of my work is hybrid. My first two books are hybrid poetry, prose books. Um, and this YA memoir uh, is actually, so when you think about it, my, my 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 hybrid collections, Island of Dreams, which is the first was my debut book, uh, YA memoir also, and then Night Blooming Jasmine. Um, I basically started in the middle. So so Island of Dreams is basically ages 13 to 19. Um, so that's sort of uh, high school through uh, like first year of college. And the first time I went back to the DR when I was 19 and that experience sort of like a coming home, but not because like you're not from here or from there. And it's sort of this weird place, right, mm -hmm. um, that you live in. And sort of my struggles like you know with identity and with my mom and um, all of that uh, 13 to 19 and then night blooming jasmine is 20 to about 33 when i was dealing with chronic illness um and autoimmune disease and infertility um and dealing again as a banana was saying like how we carry uh, that trauma in our bodies and how that trauma manifested in various autoimmune diseases for me um and dealing with that and so and the the latest ya memoir that's coming out next year is like before it's like the prequel to all of that mm -hmm. so it's ages 11 to like 14 and sort of a coming of age like my first period my first crush my for like lots of firsts that that happened uh, learning to speak english um but also um grappling more deeply with coming uh, which i didn't until my 30s but really um coming to accept my blackness and real and like sort of understanding like the grayness that I, that, that sort of the unspoken things that lived in that time period from like 11 to 13 and ne me never really identifying as black and just like not understanding like why people saw me that way or what was going like, no, I'm Latina, I'm Latina, right? And like, because this idea of like Afro Latinidad did not enter into my life until my twenties. And mm -hmm. then um, me identifying as black did not happen until my thirties. And so sort of like that early, like when I was a kid, just like, what, you know, and like trying to really navigate all of that. Um, and, and, sh and showing, um, and it, my love for reading and writing uh, and theater happens at that age also. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of me exploring that. And there are these, there are these sort of short micro essays, basically 800 to maybe a thousand words each. Um, so it kind of goes pretty quickly. Um, and it's my first book that's being, that'll be a bilingual book. So on one side, it'll be English, the other side will be Spanish. And I'm, really nervous because no, I mean like no, the rest of my that. family can read it. <laughs> so I'm, just like, oh, no. I'm like, oh shit, the people in the DR are gonna read it. Uh, I mean it's nothing like scandalous, but sometimes you say things about people, you know, in your yeah. family and they might be like, Por qué dice eso de la tía? Por qué dice? you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm excited but also a little nervous. But, yeah. Oh that's a that just that that's the highlight of my day because as somebody who can speak Spanish okay but just cannot read Spanish like I'm always looking for books that are in both Spanish and English mm -hmm. so like that that just gives me literally <laughs> something that I'm actively searching for so I'm gonna buy like three copies of that book <laughs> just just mine like oh, I'm so excited sorry I'm you like really emotional I'm so <laughs> Whew, okay, let me not start crying in this live stream, y'all. Okay. Um, my next question is going to be for Aya, and um, it's about your spy novel, which I'm really excited about. So, A Spy in the Struggle, your first standalone, is one of my most anticipated releases this year. It features a Black woman attorney for the FBI who is sent to infiltrate an eco-racial justice organization. How did you come up with this concept, and were you nervous to write about such a sensitive topic? Um, so I came up with this, I was an activist in my teens and my 20s, and I came up with this idea in my 20s because I was part of this racial justice organization. It wasn't eco at the time, but it was this organization, and you know, we were doing kind of edgy community organizing work. We are studying the Black Panthers. It was an African-American, primarily African-American organization. And, um, 
you know, we were studying the Panthers, and if you study the Panthers, you study like what happens when the government starts infiltrating an organization and trying to destroy it. And so one of the things that we would talk about sometimes is like, hey, what would we ever do like if that happened to us? So that was what put the idea in my head. And then, you know, if you're a writer, you come across an interesting idea, and what do you do? You have to write a book about it. And so I was really, um, you know, the thing that we talked about was that part of what made the Black Panthers vulnerable was that they didn't have strong relationships where they trusted each other, right? And that, so the FBI could come along and say, hey, so-and-so, this other cat said this about you. And we'd be like, what? You know, and then they would be fighting. And so we were like, wow, we have to have really strong relationships because if we have really strong relationships, then people can't leverage us against each other in these particular ways. And so then what became fascinating to me was like, well, what if somebody tried to infiltrate us, uh, an organization where they did have strong relationships? And what if the community was so transformative that the black person who had been sent in to infiltrate them, who would obviously have a lot of trauma if they're there spying on their people, like how would they be affected, right? So that's really what this book is about. You know, this black woman, she's a millennial, she's like done everything right, and she's ready to get the gold ring because she did it and she was ready to make all those sacrifices and she did everything that the white people and the Thing said she was supposed to do and of course it's not working right so you know so the book is also about kind of the betrayal of the millennial generation you know and so part of what happens is she has this trauma that's led her to be like I got to do it all myself and I got to be better than all the white people and all the men and I will and it's you know she is doing corporate law and of course her corporate firm gets indicted for securities fraud because that's what these cats are out there doing and then she ends up working for the FBI so it was you know so for me it really is also about that thing of like what is this American dream that's promising us all of this stuff if we play a particular role and the betrayal right because it doesn't really promise that and then where does it leave someone who has invested their entire life in that um, but of course, you know, it's also a mystery because there's a, you know, there's a, a death of a black woman that is not adequately explained, right? And they're trying to get justice for her and the question of, you know, black lives mattering. And it's a, it's, you know, it's primarily an African-American organization, but there are Latinx and Afro-Latinx characters as well. It's also a romance because that's how I get down, but it's also a romance because part of what happens when we start to fall in love is it destabilizes everything that we thought we believed and it pulls, you know, it removes some of our defenses. So that's also really important. And, you know, the thing that's interesting, I, um, if I, so I started writing the book in my 20s. And in my 20s, coming from the West Coast, like Afro Latinidad was not only not a thing, but there was like nobody else who had it around me, right? Because the context that I came up in, right? The context that I came up in, you could be three things. You could be black, you could be white. No, there were four. You could be black, white, Mexican, or Chinese, right? And all the Asians who weren't Chinese were mad. They're like, I'm not Chinese, right? And all the kind of Chicano looking Mexicans who weren't Mexicans were like, I'm not Mexican. But that was all you could be. And I was obviously not Mexican, right? So it was like, you're black, that's it. And my mom, who's very white looking Puerto Rican, they were like, and you're white. So we were like, dang, we just can't win here. Mm -hmm. And so, I didn't have a sense of my after Latinidad. that. I mean, I knew I was Puerto Rican, but like there was no place to put that. So it's interesting. If I had started writing this book now, I think there would have been a different kind of cultural nuance in the book, um, just in terms of the protagonist. Like it never occurred to me that she wouldn't just be an African American protagonist. She has some Southern roots. Her mom would have probably been, you know, would have been some kind of some Latina, and that might have been in the mix. But uh, it's just interesting. It's interesting to think about. Uh, this is the book that is being published that I've lived with the longest. Like I've lived with this book, you know, decades. And it's wild, you know, to have it being published in the year that, you know, the country's on fire around Breonna Taylor, you know, so that it's like this kind of 
you know, Black Lives Matter is totally fused into the book. And for years, people were like, what is this book? Why, you know, we don't get, you know, like I remember talking to agents about it and they were like, who's going to read that, you know, like a decade ago. So um, I'm grateful that things have moved and that, you know, things have moved a little bit in the industry, things have moved a lot in the community, um, and that folks are ready to have those conversations in a lot of ways, including in fiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, it's a, it's going to be extremely timely. Like this book is poised to come out at a time where I think people are ready to receive it, um, and I think also the people who have been waiting for it are just going to be you know extremely ready for it. Um, you know, and especially too because I think we need to have more conversations surrounding what it is to be black in an oppressive organization, right? Um, the FBI is an oppressive organization, right? Like, and, and what does that mean? What does it mean to be a black woman a part of that? Um, you know, and so, especially if you're one of those people that, you know, is joining an organization to try and reform or change, et cetera. Um, we, I, I hear a lot of people encouraging folks to do that, but then once people get into those organizations, we kind of just abandon them, right? Uh, the discourse just kind of dis dissipates. We're like, oh, well, you're a part of it. And and so um, I'm really excited to read this book and to see how all these really sensitive topics are tackled. And it's going to be amazing. <laughs> I'm excited about it. And, you know, like I said, it's the book I've lived with the longest. It's so weird to have something come out. Because, you know, with the Justice Hustler series, I was writing romances also, and the romance clock is quick. So, you know, once I was under contract, they got a book a year from me. So I was writing them really quickly. So I'd have a book coming out that I had only been working on for a short time. So it was really different to have something that I'd been, you know, that I've been sitting with for really, you know, half my life. Right. Okay, um, so we have what, we've got approximately like a half hour left and I have got questions that I want you all to answer. Um, of course, if there's like a question you just like don't have anything to add, you don't, you don't have to answer it. But I just, let's just start with the one that's I think the most relevant. Um, and that question is, do y'all have any tips for Afro-Latinx folks who are trying to survive 2020? <laughs> Especially me. Help me, please. Well, <laughs> You're all like, I no. Mean, I can rest. Am I freezing? What's happening? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's weird. Yeah. I don't know. Something's weird with my video, but um, you can hear me, so that's what matters. Anyway, what I was going to say that has been the thing that has helped me the most in these crazy times has been... Um, this question of um, looking at old trauma, right? So like right now is a really, really tough time and there are things happening in the present that are really hard things, but it's also incredibly triggering. And so the biggest gift that anyone has given me has been to encourage me to understand that I'm seeing all of it now through the lens of my trauma and to work on that. Um, yeah, it's been interesting. Um, I don't know if I is still working. I think it's lagging. I think she's thin. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, it's been interesting for me because I do trauma work. And so I have been, um, a lot of my clients are trapped with people that hurt them. And it's been, and I've been their person, right? I've been the person that they talk every week and they can talk to. And, and I found that their, the trauma work that we've been doing has kind of paused and I'm just holding their experience right now. And we're not going back to the old trauma that we were working on, right? So all the people I work with are, um, have a PTSD diagnosis. That's how they are in our clinic. So, um, and we do trauma processing. So we're working with, you know, from childhood to adulthood. Um, and so a lot of that has paused and we're just kind of like on a holding pattern. I'm just kind of holding their, their right now and, and, and learning to manage, like manage um, the, 
the pain, like all the way that the pain is being like kind of dusted up by what's happening around us. And for me, it's been, it's been also me trying to like steward my own, like you have like, I love my work, but the cost of it is that there's a lot of vicarious trauma. So I have, I, I hear a lot of hard things. So there's a cost for do, of doing this work for me. And something that I've been trying to do is like sit, like, meditate and sit a lot with like what's going on in my body as I'm thinking about not my clients were like, I, I feel like I have a way to hold that, but hearing the news, hearing what's happening, the, the aunt, like the S like almost like escalating horror and terror that we are experiencing. Like it's almost like day to day. Like I remember last week when, um, um, RBG died. Like I felt like I, I had to sit and like, l like, l like pay attention to what's happening in my body. Cause I was like, like, I was like almost levitating. Mm. So I think it's, it's, it's so much what I was saying. It's like, we have, we like generational trauma, right? Like we come in our part of like the work we do in our clinics, like we think about um, what trauma does to the sense to, to the nervous system. So we are, we come into the world with a sensitized nervous system because the genetic expression is changed by trauma. So, and so we have to, like, I'm trying to hold on to my body, my mind and body connection through this and really trying to meditate, really trying to center myself and, and do the things that bring me joy. I'm reading a lot of romance. I'm writing a lot of romance um, because it's, it helps me um, be in joy. I have to find things that help me be in joy and, and really feel it because trauma wants you to like, wants to like, like trauma splits you, right? It splits your experience from your body and your mind. So you have like integrating ourselves, like trying to be our whole self together. It's what yeah. I'm trying to do through this. And I mean, I think it's day to day it changes. Yeah. No, I 100% like agree with that. Like echo all of that. And it's like, for me, it's been, I started like a, hardcore meditation practice when you know when the pandemic started it, like a few weeks in when I was like oh this thing is this is going nowhere this is this is not going to go anywhere anytime soon uh, I'm here at least till you know 2022 in my house uh because you know I have multiple autoimmune diseases so I cannot risk you know even a trip to Target for me is like really stressful um so I've been very much just like you know like Adriana said I've been just finding time for rest finding time for to breathe and to meditate uh finding time to find joy like we think that like we have to be in tune and feeling sorrow and grief 24 seven because everything is literally burning all around us. But like, no, that's what they want us to believe. Like we, we can rest and we can step away and we can disconnect and we can dance and we can sing with our loved ones and we can cook a good meal and savor every bite. And we can drink a glass of wine. If that's, you know, your thing, we can watch a funny movie. We can read a book. I mean, it's the reason I started writing a Y fiction book. I, yo, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't write fiction characters out of nowhere. What am I doing? Um, but it's fun. It's so much fun. And it brings me so much joy. And I will fail exquisitely. And I'm okay with that. Like, you know, I, I, I have so much fun doing it. And so I think that that's, we just need to try to find those moments of joy and like really um, feel them in our bodies, right? Because yeah, again, like our bodies carry trauma. Like I've started, my lupus has started flaring. I've, I've, I know like my lungs are inflamed. Um, and, and so I've been working to try to like, calm that down and like, you know, really breathe because I can't breathe. Like when I breathe in, like it hurts my rib cage. And I'm like, that's my lupus. Uh, and I hadn't felt that since, since before the pregnancy. And so I know it's like my body is absorbing the stress and the trauma of like, that's all around me and the images that I'm looking and the things that I'm reading on Twitter and you know, all of that. And so like, I encourage folks to like, if, if you can, like, if you're not a journalist or like a medic person on the front line, like disconnect from the world for a few hours, even just an hour, like, take a bath, take a shower, take a walk, like sip, you know, a smoothie, whatever, like some tea, whatever is your, you know, whatever's going to relax you for, for a few and just like, yeah, take that time. Um, because it's, it's so necessary. Um, I think, and, and yeah, I've started, I've, I color, um, I'm very big on like aromatherapy. So there's like, there's a candle burning right now. I burn my little incensio, my palo santo, at least once a day, I'm like breathing in, like, you know, I'm all about it. 
So find those like sensory pleasurable experiences. Like, I don't know if my mom's watching this, but like masturbate. Um, get yours, you know, go get yours. Like if you don't got a partner, go get, like find it, Be, you know, feel good, release that somehow. So anyway. I'm here for all of this. Um, I think, you know, it's everything about what everyone said. And I guess for like the added Bruja is just like, remember that you are the magic and that you can unlock it. And, mm -hmm. and always remember that you can empower yourself to be whole by reconnecting back into yourself and going back to basics. Mm -hmm. Disconnecting is probably the most important thing we can do. We don't always have to be in suffering mode or trying to save everybody else. Let's save ourselves mm -hmm. one at a time. Yes. yes, all of that. All of that. I'm so glad that y'all are doing what you can with your power right now um, during this time because it's critical, you know, and I'm really proud of y'all for doing that work, even though it's it, it can be excruciating, you know, but you got to do it because you're precious, you know, you're the, the most precious thing in the world. So, OK, let me not get emotional. OK, um, so switching gears. What does the perfect day and the perfect night look for each of you? I'll jump in because I just had it the other day. It was it was like so perfect. It was so nice. Um, so I, my, the perfect day is like I, I start with writing. I'm able to write. I get like my full two hours. My child doesn't wake up before 7 a.m. And I can get like a good solid 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. writing like, you know, and I get the words out. May not be great, but they're out. And so I definitely start my day with writing um, and then spend time with, you know, little Luz Maria, my daughter, however that may look like breakfast, you know, with with my partner, with my spouse. Um, and uh and time by the water. I was able to go to Galveston Beach for uh, about four days uh, last week and just like be near the ocean, man. I like more and more. I'm like, I said, oh, I said, I'm going to retire and live by the water. And I'm like, what am I waiting for? Another pandemic? Like, fuck it. Like, let's figure this out. Like, five year plan. How am I getting to the ocean? Like, what are we doing? Because it feeds me and it nourishes me. And so I need, I need that time. Um, yeah. And then I think you know, a nap somewhere in there is always good. You always need a nice, nice nap. <laughs> it's a nice day, daytime thing, some reading. Uh, and then, yeah, a nice a quiet evening, you know, some wine, a movie, a really good, like delicious dinner, uh, or maybe a walk somewhere. Um, you know, back in the day, it might've been like, back in the day, all of six months ago, it might've been a movie <laughs> and dinner, date night. <laughs> <laughs> with my husband uh but now it's like you know netflix or something on the couch and uh and just just relaxing just being able to know that like the people you love and care for are nearby and are alive and well um and that you're able to do the things that you love uh, and take care of the people that you love that to me is, is always a good day mm -hmm. i'll jump in and say can y'all hear me i know i'm lagging a little bit but i think i caught up mm -hmm. um so first of all, you and I have the same morning plan, that five to seven writing. Oh my God. It's like, but lately my daughter's been waking up early. Why are you doing that? Stop doing that. Right? That's my time. Or I've been going, I've been sleep, you know, waking up in the night and then sleeping late. Terrible. No, that's my time. Um, so that really, that really sets the day, right? Because if I'm able to get that handled, then I feel like I've done the thing that I really needed to do for me to move me forward in this very particular me way. And now I can deal with y'all. So that's really important. And then, you know, so as, as like an activist in this moment of like incredible crisis and incredible urgency, I have taken Naomi Klein's, uh, words to heart where she basically says f work-life balance you know because we're just in this particular moment so i feel like for me the the really good days are the days where i'm really productive and able to multitask where i'm just able to move a whole lot of stuff i'm able to get handle you know take care of myself take care of my family have a little fun, get some writing done, 
do the work I need to do and move something in the in the world of activism. And you know, the one thing I will say about those two hours in the morning, y'all, I ponied up for a treadmill desk because I walk and write and it's just changed my life. So like hmm. for me, if I could be doing two things at once, three things at once, or sometimes even four things at once, I'm like, yes. And then I just feel like I've got a level of momentum in this moment that is needed. At some point that will not be the ideal day, right? Because I would like to have a little more calm and leisure and ocean and all those things are so good. But like right now, it just feels like it's blast off. So that's what I got. I'll just jump in because I'm like polar opposite to all of this. <laughs> um, I think my my best days are kind of when I can speak the energy that I want for the day and it actually pans out. So if I want like an easeful, joyous day and it's like, okay, it was efficient, but there's also time for play. So, you know, being able to finish stuff, but also making sure that I add play, be it coloring, be it listening to Perreo, whatever it is, just getting some joy in. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I'm i feeling the need to push right now. And I think it's because I, like I, I, I work in, I live right outside of New York City, but I work in the city. So I've lost my commute time and my commute time was time for me to listen to music, to listen to a book, to be in the city. I get, I'm an extrovert. I get a lot of energy from being around people. I love being in Manhattan. I love being in Harlem. Like I've mourned not being able to like be with like my people all the time in that way. And so I'm feeling, I have all this energy. So I, the way my week is, um, I write um, two full days a week, I just write. And then three days a week, I see clients. And my clients, I see through video conference or phone calls right now. So I have three days where I'm a therapist and write in the morning that 5 to 7 a.m. time to write. And then I, and I do like my therapy work. Um, and so to me, like what's feeling really good is to, again, to like feel like I have my writing time because my writing time gives me a release that I need for my days where I see clients. Cause I like, I have, you know, a caseload and they're hard conversations. Sometimes it's a lot. And so I hold my, it's a different way of working than when I'm just writing. So for me, I'm feeling the need to be productive. So I'm trying to find ways to just like do what I need to get done. And then in the evening, um, I don't know, watch Netflix, drink a glass of wine in the backyard, um, but feel like I've, I've done what I needed to do for the day is feeling especially satisfying. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not exhausted, I think, because I'm used to like the hour commute. Like I don't have like that, like throw my purse when I get home at the end of the day moment. I'm just like, oh, I was in my office. Now I'm going to go to the kitchen. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so I'm feeling like I need that like, sense of like I did something productive. Mm. I hear that. Okay. Tell me what three foods rem taste exactly like your childhood. I actually had to write these down to think and because there's just so much food. Um, I think for me it's Wanawana anything. So ice cream, juice, smoothie, whatever. Um, legume, which is a Haitian dish uh, with rice and sauce flour, arroz con habichuela. Um, and then the last one is pastelon, which is the mm. sweet plantain lasagna with ground beef in between. Hands down, hands down. Mm. My mouth is watering. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. I love pasta long. Mm. I'm hungry. I'm so mad I don't know how to make any of those things. Um, for me, it's probably uh, sancocho. My mommy sancocho. Always. I'm a sucker for any like soup, stew, caldo. Like that's like my go-to comfort food. Um, then probably um, her arroz con pollo or just like that. Yeah, arroz con pollo is so good. But like 
I'm gonna say this as a meal. You can't you can't say it's all my three. It's but with the with the with the sostones. Like you have to have the the ronco pollo with the sostones on the side. Um, and then the third one would probably be. No, clearly this is why I'm on Weight Watchers. Arroz con leche, all this rice. Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's sweet because I love sweets. And so those three things are always, this, anytime my mom comes over, I'm like, you know, we have this like this amount of time to make me all three of those things. Like I need those things in my life. So, yeah. Mm. All right, I'll jump in. Can y'all hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. I know I'm a little bit frozen in the video, but um. You know, it's so interesting because one of the things about being the the second generation born in the States is I didn't get the food. So mm -hmm. I grew up very West Coast and, and I the things that really make me think of my childhood are like the candies that I certainly haven't had in decades, right? So like the candies that came to mind were all the powder candies, like Fun Dip and Pixie Sticks. Like those, I just remember them because, you know, once you're past a certain age, you don't eat those anymore. So they're very childhood. Mm -hmm. And then also now and laters. Oh my God, the now and laters, right? Like the dental work that I probably had to have based from those now or laters. And then the third one that's just something that, you know, again, is not in my adult life at all. It's like Pringles, like those crazy like <laughs> chips that were all the same. Anyway, those are the three things that I thought of, like those are childhood foods. Because my mom, you know, we didn't get the food. We didn't get the Puerto Rican food. I probably hadn't had a platano until I was in my 20s. So like, yeah, it was interesting. It's like sort of a void of that food. And then of course, once I was like, ah, oh, this is the stuff, you know, and then cook it at home. Yeah. Now and later be ripping your teeth out of your gums. Ripping your <laughs> teeth out though. Yeah, for real. Yeah, for real. Um, it's interesting, Aya, because you were in the West Coast, but um, my, I grew up in the DR, but my aunties, my my dad's sisters immigrated to the to the States in the 60s, and a, and, a, and a half of them stayed in the Bronx, but the other half moved to San Diego in the yeah. 80s. Mm -hmm. And I would come with my abuela every year to visit family, would be here for like two months. And my, my grandma would bring platanos to my aunties in San Diego because in the eighties you couldn't find you couldn't, you couldn't find like she needed like the chocolate tablets to make the hot chocolate. Like we would have a suitcase just of food to bring to the San Diego contingent because in the Bronx you could find some stuff. But not and not even that much, but it, you could not find at all the stuff in, in the West Coast. That's interesting that um so that, but um, my food, I, I was thinking about that because I have many, but one thing that I've been thinking a lot about is this thing called hagua. Hagua is, I don't even know what it is. It's like a fruit that Dominicans, we cut it in slices and we put it like in a jar of water and it just like the, the cut fruit just like infuses the water. And my grandmother always had agua de hagua in her house and you just like, and she put like a ton of sugar in it. And then she would just like give that to us like whenever we came back from playing outside. And I've just had like that flavor in my mouth for like the last two months. And I keep thinking about the smell of Ohagua. And I honestly do not even know what the name of it is in English um, or what fruit it is. Um, the other one is um, morcilla, it's blood, my my grandmother made more my my dad's mother made more stilla every year um, around this time when it was starting to get cold mm -hmm. and so i've been thinking a lot about more stilla. and then my favorite thing to, was always sancocho which is like a dominican stew um and it was always like a special thing for me when i came home and they were like sancocho for lunch mm -hmm. so that's, I guess, one of the flavors of my childhood. But habichuela con dulce too. Hundred eight degrees outside, Dominicans like. No, yeah, it's like, oh, <laughs> it's under eighty nine. If it drops under eighty nine, you got the sun. If it rains, if it rains, like I guess this have gojo. Está lloviendo. The and I don't know if I'm wrong about this, but the and let me know if I'm saying it wrong. But the agua sounds like um um. Agua frescas. Yeah, it's kind of an agua fresca. So it was, it's a, the fruit is like a very dense fruit. It's got a lot of seeds and it's, hmm. you can't eat it. You can't eat agua. It's literally just 
to like cut it up and put it in like a big vat of water. Mm. And then my my grandmother did all these aguas. Like she did like a agua de arroz where she literally just put sugar and rice in a big jar and then we would horchata. just- it. It's like an horchata, yep. She loved those aguas, but the jagua, agua de jagua. Agua de jagua. That's my favorite. Okay. Interesting. Oh my gosh, I should never have asked y'all this question. I'm so hungry. Like, and I made sure to eat right before this because I knew I knew what I was getting myself into, and it didn't it didn't it didn't help. It didn't help at all. Okay, so we have like five more minutes. Um, so I'm conflict. I guess I won't ask y'all another question because I don't want to rush your amazing answers. Um, but oh, you know what? Now I guess is a really good time to. I know we've already kind of talked about. The, your upcoming projects, but since we're wrapping up, if there's anything y'all want to plug, any exciting news you just want to share, it doesn't even have to be about your work if you don't have anything. But yeah, I would I would love to hear. We would all love to hear. Um, I'll just jump in. Uh, I have recently gotten part. I've become part of an anthology. Um, with Alegria Magazine. So that's something I'm pretty excited about. It's $2.99 on Kindle. And um, my poem is all in Spanish about the, you know, the Latino world that I would like to see. And um, also my book, Soliloquy of an Ice Queen. So that's a poetry collection of breakups and bitterness in Espanol, Creole, and English. Beautiful. What about you, Jasmine? Um, for me, mostly, I just, I've got more of these kinds of events coming up. So y'all can go to my website, jasminemendez.com, two N's and an E. Um, I've got different panels and readings and talks um, throughout October and um, mostly the first two weeks of October and some things in November and December coming up. Um, I'm particularly excited about my talk slash poetry reading um, on uh, my most current work, my, my poetry book that's coming out in 2022, Machete. Uh, on the Haitian massacre of 1937. Um, so please, you know, check that out. It'll be October 6th in the evening. It's all virtual, all my events are virtual. So yeah, just go on my website and look at my events and log in and check it out. Okay. What about you, Adriana? Um, I've got all kinds of things going on, but um, my, la my latest release is this, Here to Stay. Um, it's the first in a series called Dating in Dallas. It's a uh, Dominican Puerto Rican woman who um, moves to New Yorker who moves to Dallas for her boyfriend and he dumps her for his chai chick within a couple weeks. So she stays there for her job, which she loves, and she meets another New Yorker who is, of course, like trying to cut her job. So it's like an enemies to lovers workplace romance. And there's a found family element to it. It's all these New Yorkers that have recently moved to Dallas and they become friends and they call themselves the Gotham Exiles Club. So so this is the first one. And um, I've got a couple more things coming up this year. Next month, I'm in an anthology called DILF, Duke I'd Like to F. And it's my first historical. It's a um, story set in 1879 in Paris, and it's a Dominican British woman who's a root worker. She's an herbalist and falls for a accidental Duke and they go to Paris and things happen. And then I have a Christmas novella coming out from the Dreamers Universe too later in the year. Hey. And that's what I've got going on this year. So, yeah. By the way, I saw that wild Twitter thing that happened. Went out of the book. Uh, I'm just saying, <laughs> that made me so angry. Well, I have, yeah, I am writing a historical romance, um, a historical romance series, um, which is of three Afro Latinas in the 1889 World's Fair. And someone asked me if I was writing fantasy because she has, she did, she wasn't aware of a record of Latin people <laughs> being in Europe in the 19th century. But, um, well, we weren't invented yet, or what? 400 years into colonization, we had not made it to Europe, but. We sure were there, and I'm. I have a series coming up about three Afro Latina heiresses in Paris in 1889. There's a duchess. There's a there's a lesbian romance. It's gonna be really fun. So I'm looking forward to writing that. 
Beautiful. And what about you, Aya? Oh my God. Well, oh, the first thing that I wanted to say, again, because Jasmine and I are like <laughs> the same person. I also, this year, I put out um, uh, a children's book. Um, it's a children's chapter book with an Afro-Latina protagonist, and it's called Equality Girls and the Purple Reflecto Ray. And um, I self-published it because basically the girls take on the president. And uh, I wanted to make sure that it came out before the election. Um, and uh, this it's, a, it's like a sci-fi fantasy where the girl um, develops this superpower that when she's angry, she shoots these rays out of her eyes. Anyway, it's really fun. Um, and it's mostly for kind of like the eight to 11 year old crowd. Um, so that came out, oh, and it came out on um, a site called Booklandia which is an online, an online site that specializes in books for children, um, both English and Spanish about black people. So it's a, kind of got an Afro-Latino angle on it. Um, Afro-Latinx. And um, so I have a Spy in the Struggle coming out at the end of the year. And then between now and then, the other big thing that I have going is that I write for, I blog for The Daily Dose, which is, um, Feminist Voices for the Green New Deal. So it's an intersectional feminist website. And, you know, we've been writing a lot about Black Lives Matter, a lot about the election. Um, and I'm working on a piece about this whole issue of like, how does the election trigger us in terms of our old trauma? And how does that triggering confuse us into thinking that this cat can win? Because he can't win. He can steal, but he can't win, right? And so um, this is a piece that I'm working on um, you know, to get out in, you know, the next few weeks. Oh, and then I'm also working on a hip hop romance, which will come out sometime in next year from Kensington, but it doesn't have a, doesn't have a title yet. Okay. Beautiful. Um, Liz, did you go? You did go. Okay. You went earlier. That's right. I was like, wait a second. Okay, cool. Um, so that I think I think this is a really good spot to wrap up, yeah. Unless anyone has anything beautiful, um, thank you so much, y'all, for sharing your energy, your experiences, your work, your creativity, all of that with us. Um, this was an amazing panel. Um, I'm like I said, I was really honored to be in conversation with each and every one of you. So thank you. Um, and yes, so for those watching, if you don't follow these authors already, make sure that you do. Um, and we'll see you in the future. Bye. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.